That's Dewey Lee Curtis. Looking at the beginning of the trust in 1977, when Dewey Lee Curtis organized meetings in Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, New York, and invited leading decorative arts experts to help advance an educational organization that would be to the decorative arts what the National Trust was to architecture. He envisioned a national membership of 100,000 people with chapters around the country. The description of the trust that would be used as the letterhead for a while and on all printed material read, quote, the purpose of the Decorative Arts Trust is to harness the tremendous energies, talents, knowledge, and expertise of many Americans who share a deep interest in the decorative arts and to bring these energies together in a broad-based national movement. Such a trust has long been the dream of collectors, curators, dealers across the country. Now that dream is a reality. The Decorative Arts Trust seeks your support. We are in, uh, an incorporated tax-free body with energetic leadership and a definitive plan. This national movement deserves your support. Join with us. So, unquote. Uh, excellent scholarship was always the mainstay, always. And this was a time when little information about the Decorative Arts Trust was available, when dipping and stripping antique wooden furniture was a craze across the country. I don't know. The advertised mission statement worked, and the Decorative Arts Trust was off and running in 1978 with bylaws written by the young lawyer John Fraser Hunt, Gray Boone, a nationally uh, recognized name in the field as president, and all under the directionship of Dewey Lee Curtis. Our beloved Wendell Garrett uh, soon took over as president, giving the organization even more national recognition, and Dewey sought a director who could take his place. He hired a retired army officer who didn't stay long. <laughs> Then came the wonderful Hope Cooper of Camden, South Carolina. She moved the headquarters from New Hope, Pennsylvania to Camden and began an ambitious agenda that would include traveling exhibits, spot on for the mission of the trust. Hope's vision was perfect, but the trust treasury was not. <laughs> the trust lit back to Philadelphia with $72 in the treasury and John Hunt <laughs> agreed to take over as president. He saved the trust from, uh, uh, with solid direction and a knack for raising interest and funds. One of the symposiums, I've, uh, one of the first symposiums I attended was the Princess Anne Maryland meeting held in a tiny historic parish hall. Registration was $58.00 to hear the legendary Joe Kendig III, William Voss Elder, curator of the American Wing at the Baltimore Museum, and Jennifer Goldsboro, the perpetual queen of important silver, and others. Ms. Maudie Jeffers was the host for the weekend, and I remember she and a, com a committee of people from the Historical Society stayed up late one night making crab cakes and pickled apples for the lunch boxes the next day. They were delicious, and that's the way things were done in the early days of the trust. I left the advertising world to run the trust just in time for the Palm Beach Symposium 1984, an excellent symposium held at the be beautiful Flagler Mansion Whitehall. And I was so impressed by the small orchestra brought in for terrace dancing in the moonlight after dinner. Afterwards, back at the office, when I got the bill, I was less impressed. <laughs> it totally blew the budget. Luckily, the host organization who had hired them agreed to pay for it. In the beginning, it was customary to split the profits uh, with the host organization and to split the losses. The orchestra incident brought that lesson home. But as time went on, our hosts became the large museums rather than the local historical societies. The reluctance to share impossible losses became a sticking point. Their large boards, corporate uh, lawyers, 
and a contract asking, asking them to split profits and losses with this little organization just did not work. Luckily, the third symposium I worked on was co-sponsored with the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation, Monticello, and UVA. Dan Jordan was director of Monticello, and he welcomed the idea of a symposium centered on Monticello because nothing like that had ever happened before. All the great Jefferson scholars at that time spoke. Helen Scott got all her cousins to open their Jefferson houses. We had a candlelight dinner in the rotunda, which you'd never have today, where, um, where Jefferson's great, 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 great grandson, who looked exactly like him, appeared out of the darkness dressed as Jefferson and stayed in character as he visited all the tables. <laughs> It was fabulous. We had private tours of Monticello. As the sun set, we enjoyed Jefferson's favorite Madeira on the terrace. Did I mention that people scrambled to get a place at this symposium? Nothing like this was happening at the time on a national scale with full schedule of top scholars speaking. This was new for everyone, and they came. Museum directors, curators, collectors, decorators, historians, and, quote, people who shared an interest in the decorative arts, unquote, as Mary Jane Poole so beautifully wrote. 250 was the cutoff number. All afternoon tours had to be run twice by rotating the days. Well, it was a super success, and the bottom line was two. And this is what I was getting at. Dan Jordan saw the great potential of the Decorative Arts Trust. And after huddling with John Hunt, <laughs> said, we want the Decorative Arts Trust to keep all the money. So, bless his heart, this put us on a wonderful financial position for uh, really the first time and sent the trust on its way to a solid future, except for what, what uh, Jonathan mentioned about Hartford. Um, in the spring of 1986, uh, we were able to buy our first computer, therefore, and named it TJ. Paradox was our database and it turned out to be the database for several of the local banks. This was new territory for everybody. <laughs> we became faster and more organized. Now, the idea of, of, uh, that we could hire someone from the, re from the revered Winter Tour Fellowship Program was unthinkable. At that time, Winter Tour grads were not supposed to go into business. And then came Connie Hershey, a Winter Tour grad. Connie and I had worked on several loan exhibits at, for the Philadelphia Antique Show and enjoyed it so much that she agreed to come aboard as contributing editor of our newsletter in 1987. Our symposium brochures began to be printed in uh, color in 2007, another advancement from the computer age because color images no longer had to be sent off for co costly color separations. By the year 2000, the Decorative Arts Trust had its own website. With this, we began to uh, expand our scholarship program from the Dewey Lee Curtis Scholars at each symposium to study grants for individual students and then grants placed through museums. The trust, not being a museum, but wanting to support graduate students in museum work, had to work out how this could be achieved. Well, Brock Job, highly regarded professor of Winnetour and trust board member, took the lead and soon our student grants were successful and expanding. By the mid-1990s, VIP and the Winter Antique Show in New York was part of our annual schedule. Uh, early entrance to the show, lunch at the Armory's Historic Rooms, thanks to Sarah Donham and her team of volunteers, top-level Americana dealers, collectors in the city, made it a place of continuing excellent experiences for trust members. New York board uh, members, Ralph Harvard, Marquise Howell, and Mary Jane Poole, kept important invitations coming our way. Then, the extremely popular study trip abroad, study trips abroad, started in 1996 when Helen Scott Reed, then head of the board's development committee, suggested we do overseas trips as fundraisers. 
At the time, the Academy was beginning to look across the Atlantic for the influences brought to America. And there was debate, but in the end, we partnered with uh, the Center for Palladian Studies, on whose board Helen Scott also sat, to offer a trip to Venice and the Veneto. The prize of this uh, was an architectural scholar, Mario de Valmorano from UVA, uh, who would lead the group, provide access to private villas, Palladian villas, and most of all, his beautiful and amazing mind. His gentle descriptions and explanations of Palladio's work were poetry. It was an extra plus that his family also owned the Villa Rotunda and he spent childhood summers there. This was such a privilege for the trust and word got around. There was a huge demand for another trip so we offered it again in the fall of 1996. Uh, there was no more discussion about the appropriateness of study trips abroad. Ireland, Holland, Scotland, London, Bath, Paris, south of France, and footsteps of Jefferson, Berlin, Prague, Stockholm, Tallinn, St. Petersburg, Grand Tour 1, Grand Tour 2, Habsburg in Austria, Portugal, Poland, Krakow of uh, Warsaw, the Hanseatic League, Maastricht Antiques Fair, Spain, Alsace, and the list goes on. These trips were not co cookie cutter trips offered by a travel company. They were all original, planned by the trust with Helen Scott Reed in the lead. She had always been uh, an extensive traveler and knew every, as she would say, wild and crazy, excellent thing to see. She is the secret ingredient for the success of these study trips. By now, John Hunt, after putting the trust on sound financial footing, turned over the reins to Jonathan Fairbanks, who remained president for 19 years. Jonathan is a champion of American objects of all periods, um, from 17th century furniture to the silver Paul Revere to the works of contemporary American Indian potters. And during his tenure, he generously shared all this and more with great scholarship and contagious enthusiasm, making dedicated collectors out of all of us. Here he is painting a portrait of the Yale Symposium in 18th century English style, so we could see. And here he is, hands and knees, um, examining the... Uh, stones on the um, uh, uh, porch of the Hermitage in Tennessee. Um, Bruce Perkins came next to the presidency in 2008. Uh, Bruce is a collector, a businessman insuring collections, a person who had been a member of the trust since his college days at Washington Lee University, where he was the first student intern at the at uh, Jim Whitehead's new Reeves Center filled with Chinese export, export porcelain. Bruce also knew every dealer and every American decorative arts curator in the business. And he sort of brought them all into the fold. He was a huge uh, plus for the trust. Um, he also had stepped out as chairman of Winnetour Board, so brought great working knowledge of uh, arts institutions. Randy Scrimcher agreed to take over the gavel in 2012 and brilliantly and unflaggingly headed the transition team to replace the retiring executive director, me. Uh, <laughs> he and his committee worked diligently and came to the conclusion that Matt Thurlow was the person. Now Matt and Chuck Ockrey, in this queue. Um, president, uh, president Chuck was president since uh, 2015, are leading the Decorative Arts Trust into the future, and bravo. So, through the years, people have asked me, what do you love most about the trust? My, <laughs> my answer uh, has always been, when the lights go down and the images go up, 
and a person who has spent years and years of their life researching and developing the topic begins to speak. That, to me, is the heartbeat of the trust. From my vantage point, I can say with pleasure, if you regularly attend trust symposiums and study trips, after a few years, and if you're lucky, after many years, you will look back on your experiences, the accomplished people you have met, the amazing collections you have witnessed so personally, and it will be one of the great pleasures of your life. Thank you, Dewey.